OK, if I'm going to introduce new information, I need to remember that the brain uses all the senses to take in, to receive information. Uh, we see it, we hear it, we touch it, sometimes we smell it and we taste it. We can't always do all of those uh, in a lesson, but with Google Image Search, we can always have a picture of it. In fact, one message I would kind of shout out to educators all over the world is, listen, use pictures. The brain is overwhelmingly an image processor. So always use a picture, uh, use keywords, rather like I've done this slide here, in fact, where I've tried to use a picture, some keywords, and, and what I hope is an engaging quote. Um, so you're kind of like seeing the information as well as hearing me talk about it. Um, it does remind me of the geography teacher who was teaching about the rainforest. Um, and as the kids came into his room, he had scrolling pictures on his interactive whiteboard uh, of the rainforest. Um, he had one of those CDs uh, in, in the corner playing uh, one of those deluge, torrential rain in a rainforest, so they could hear the rainforest. And he was standing at the door, and as students came in, he was giving them little slices of mango. So as they came in through the door, they could taste the rainforest, they could see the rainforest, and they could hear the rainforest. Now that's multisensory immersion. Activity, okay, I think this should be the biggest part of the lesson. We've given them some information, now they're beginning to make sense of it. This is where they process the information for deeper understanding. They begin to make sense of the information. This is where we might um, design activities to stimulate some higher order thinking. There may be pair shares, there may be card matching, things where they have to think about the new information. They begin to explore it and understand it. I think it's also the bit where we recognise that people learn, process information in different ways. Interpersonal learners who need to talk their ideas and bounce them back and forth between people or in groups. Intrapersonal learners who need to um, internalise their thinking, maybe take some time out to have a kind of quiet think about things. Kinesthetic learners who need to kind of explore it and take it apart and put it back together uh, to make sense of it. Um, and again, we can't always accommodate all of those different types of learners every lesson, but over a number of different lessons, I think we should make sure that we hit kind of everybody's learning styles. The key message is um, don't let your own learning style become your, your only teaching style, I guess. Demonstrate. Okay, the demonstrate part of the cycle is an opportunity for students to show what they have learnt, what they now understand, to apply their new understanding, perhaps in a different context. The one thing we would think about is, you know, am I asking people to just repeat back, you know, what they've learned? Give me an exa three examples of sedimentary rock. Or am I going to ask them to do something which demands, you know, a higher order thinking? Am I going to ask them to apply their thinking, compare and contrast uh, the, the rock cycle to, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the water cycle, for example? So I think that in the demonstrating your understanding, we should be getting students to apply their understanding. So make it a bit more challenging than just repeat back information. Now I'm not saying that it's not important to memorise information. If you look at Bloom's taxonomy, knowledge forms the base of that pyramid. And students certainly need to learn and remember uh, a body of knowledge. But I think we should be pushing them further as well and getting them to apply that information, the demonstrate section. Many different ways you can do it. It uh, could be an exam question. That's how they've got to show their understanding in, in the UK anyway. Um, but not just exam questions, when each one teach one. How about this group present to this group what you've learned? This group give them feedback on how well they presented it. This bit, I've said this before, uh, I think this is the one that we tend to do least well. This one is absolutely essential for learning to take place. Uh, in the UK, we tend to do this least well because we're in a heavily content-driven national curriculum. Um, you know, I've heard people talk about as being victims of the hurried curriculum. There's so much stuff to get through. We're obsessed with coverage. Um, as long as we're obsessed with coverage, I think possibly we doom some of our students to failure. What we need to do is find time, okay, in our lessons, to review what we've learned. At its simplest level, this could be re-emphasising the main points of the lesson. Uh, at, at a kind of more advanced level, it could be debriefing the learning experience you know, through the use of skillful, open-ended uh, learning questions. But at least giving students, like in this diagram here, uh, where you've got the triangle, you know, three questions I still want to ask, two things I've learned, one thing I still want to know. 
uh, is a good way of getting kids to reflect on their learning experience. And, and for me, this is the difference between learning and teaching. It reminds me of the old joke about the man who says, uh, last night I taught my dog to whistle. And his mate says, oh, go on then, let, let's hear your dog whistle. And the man replies, well, I said I taught him. I, I didn't say he'd learned. And the difference between teaching and learning is this regular review of learning, <laughs> of what we've learned, leads to effective, high-quality learning. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our framework for teaching and learning. Thank you very much.